Good evening, my little darklings. It is time for the best in paranormal talk radio. I am still under the weather and dealing with the end of COVID, so I am taking the night off, but I've got a great pre-recorded episode, one of the most terrifying tales I've ever covered. And many of you have asked to hear the story, so I've got it out. I've got it ready for you. And this Wednesday, we will be moving the live news to Thursday to give me one more day to recover. So please make note of that. No live show Wednesday. It will be Thursday. We will be back with the Paranormal 60 News crew, but stay tuned because it's the day that Satan called. Right here on the best in paranormal talk radio, I'm your host, Dave Schrader, and this is my Paranormal 60. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Baloney. Perhaps not. Good evening and welcome. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. We've got a great show. The Day Satan Called. A True Encounter with Demon Possession and Exorcism. That's tonight's topic. We begin with Bill Scott. Bill, thank you for joining us this evening. Oh, man, my pleasure. I'm excited to be on the show. This is a story. Wow, you guys literally went through hell and back in this case. Yeah, it it was a long 18 months. Had you ever dealt with or encountered any aspect of the supernatural prior to this experience? Not on any level. We were not prepared for what we were uh, about to see. Okay. All right. Well, walk us through a little bit about how you ended up in the situation you were in? What opened up this 18-month-long period of your life? Yeah, uh, you know, I worked at a Christian radio station, and I remember coming to the studio one day, and for whatever reason, the news guys beat me in there, and he answered my phone, which was very unusual, the request line. And when I walked in, I looked at Rick, and he just looked, I mean, no pun intended, though, but as he seen, he, he'd seen a ghost. And he was just very somber. And I remember asking him, I said, what's wrong? He goes, I just talked to somebody who's possessed. Well, one, Rick isn't the kind of guy that would say that. And two, I just figured he was joking. But I could tell after giving him a hard time that he was really scared about something. I didn't think that he talked to somebody who was demon possessed because who does that, right? Right. And so, you know, and and so I'm just like, you know, I'm sure she was disturbed. Hey, it's a radio station. You get all kinds that call in. It is what it is. Don't worry about it. My request line started ringing again and he goes, answer it. Well, as certain as I was that he was not quite dealing with all a reality. It did sort of scare me that he wanted me to answer the phone and I'll never forget answering it. And there's this little girl. Lacey. She said she was 16 and she needed help. And he's like, that's her. And I'm thinking, well, she didn't sound too scary to me. And I said, you know, what What can I do to help you out? And she's like, well, I'm going to be sacrificed and I need somebody to save me. Well, that you don't hear every day at a radio <laughs> station. I not mean, even, you hear a lot of a lot of weird things, right? Yeah, not, not even not on our that. show. Well, I've never once had th- that phone call come in, thank God, Bill. Yeah, exactly. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen here on this show, you would think. Right. L- well, let me ask you this. Doesn't it seem strange that if somebody truly was dealing with the demonic or possession, that the demon wouldn't rise up and try to stop the phone call from being made and the ask for help to begin with? Oh, absolutely. That's why I just, I just thought, you know, it's, it's somebody, you know, they may feel like they're going to be in trouble, but it it was just, it was an odd deal. And I I remember just thinking, you know, I'm going to get this young girl some help. I'll give her some different safe houses, churches in her area that she could call. And that'll be the end of the phone call because I wasn't necessarily a believer that she was going to be sacrificed or that I was even dealing with anything that would uh, be considered demonic. I just felt like she's going through a tough time, might be a mental thing. I mean, you just get all kinds of people that do call in with different needs. So I'm giving her, you know, hey, here's somebody in your area. Let me give you the, the telephone number. And Dave, I'm telling you that at that point, I don't know how to describe it except for a very unhuman voice came on the phone and said, she's ours. You can't have her. I just know that every hair on my body stood on edge. 
Now, I've, I've never heard a demon, never grew up thinking I would hear a demon, never wanted to hear a demon. But you could tell that there was something incredibly evil on the other side of the line. And it's just, I don't know, I just call it a very unhuman voice. I don't know how else to describe it. Well, and let's, let me I, take you back to ahead. her talking about being sacrificed. Yeah, yeah, go where, ahead. Where did your line of questioning go with that? Did you ask why or who was planning on sacrificing her? I just remember asking who, and she said she was part of a coven that uh, worshiped Satan, and it was her turn. And we didn't go much further into that because, honestly, I, I don't even know that I believed her. You could tell she felt she was in danger. You could hear it in her voice. So I didn't mind trying to direct her to some place. I sure didn't have any idea that I would even jump in to help her uh, as this thing progressed because I had no desire whatsoever, nor did I necessarily 100% think that what she was saying was true. So you get past the idea that she's telling you she's going to be sacrificed, that they have her. Then this inhuman voice comes over and says, that she's ours. We have her. Now, does this voice sound like it's coming from a little girl mocking up her voice, Linda Blair style? Or is this oh, no. voice above the sound of the phone? Like it's it's coming over like a walkie-talkie almost. Yeah, exactly. That's that's more what it. Yeah, that that's exactly the way it sounded like. Did and she just, hear that? I, did she hear it as well, or did you just hear the message? I heard it. She would never say that she heard anything. She just, you know, she'd said, "Well, I sort of blacked out. I didn't hear any of the conversation whatsoever." So she would ask, "What's going on?" And you know, at first, I didn't know what was going on. I knew it was something very evil. I mean, you could feel that. Well, yeah. The presence was overwhelming, but I didn't really know what to do with it. I still am trying to process. I mean, it's coming at you like a freight train. And when sure. you're someone who has never dealt with anything, look, I mean, I grew up in church and all, and I know there there's some denominations that, that lean more towards dealing with demons. That was not our denomination. <laughs> all right. So it, it just wasn't. I mean, we did not talk about it. I mean, yes, it's in the Bible and You'd hear a Bible verse or something like that, but it was never focused on, hey, be prepared for when you encounter something that's demonic. So I didn't grow up in that particular kind of denomination. It was very conservative. So I'm just trying to figure out what have I stepped into and how do you even handle something like this? And, and she'd hang up. She'd call back. We'd go through the whole thing. And, and this thing would interrupt saying, that, you know, she's ours and you can't have her. And, of course, this is before cell phones because it's in the late 80s. What would you say so, to the voice? I mean, were you saying, well, she's, she's calling me. We are going to help her. Or were you just ignoring the voice, hoping that if you didn't acknowledge it, it wouldn't continue? Well, you know, at first I, I acknowledged it to some degree, just saying, no, we are going to help her. I had no idea how we were going to help her, but. I figured somebody's got to have an answer and, and right. can help her in. And I still didn't know if the whole sacrifice thing was real. This is just sort of a byproduct of the phone call. Mm -hmm. um, at, at that point, I'm not even so much thinking about the sacrifice as I am. What in the world is going on? And, you know, this went on and I, I felt like, OK, there is a, a girl that's in danger and we needed to help her. And so that much I did know. And I thought, you know, she kept calling from different phone booths. We had even sent some of our staff out to try to find her because she'd give different landmarks. And we go, okay, we think we know where she's at. And uh, you just, you know, you couldn't do it. By the time we get there, she'd be gone or we were at the wrong phone booth. And this actually lasted for a few days. Well, if she, she was still in such wondered, a hurry to get help, why wouldn't she just say, Bill, I'm at McDonald's on the corner of 5th and, and uh, Larpender, come get me? Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know if this thing was trying to move her. I mean, I, I didn't know how any of this worked, right? You know, because she would say she wanted help. Then it was like, you know, she belongs to us. She can never get help. And, and I'm just thinking, okay, so what is really going on? I mean, is there somebody after her for real? And she's running? I mean, I have no clue. I just know when that evil thing would speak, it was just, and, and by the way, we, we never put any of this on the radio, of course. Right. I mean, it, it wasn't a show that was geared towards a supernatural. It was just a music station. So we, we didn't have this on the air. Plus, we didn't want to really make her a spectacle to other people. And plus, I think you'd probably lose a lot of listeners, you know, it's just. <laughs> well, I don't know to, hey, about that. A, people might have tuned well, in I mean, in droves to hear that. Well, that's true. I mean, it's it was mind boggling. But I had I have to tell you, Dave, there were times I wondered, were we being played in right. some way or another? I mean, it well, was weird because you, right? you could. Yeah, you could feel the evil. And it was a very unnatural kind of voice that would speak. But you still have to wonder, OK, 
Really? And I'll never forget. Here's what tipped the scales for me. Uh, I was either day two or three that we were talking to her. And, you know, we would even talk to her uh, when I wasn't on the air. We, if, if she called, then we would get around a, uh, a phone in the studio or the office someplace and, and try to find her. There was a lady that worked at the church and she had had encounters, I guess, years ago with the supernatural. I'm not sure what all the details were with her, but she asked, she said, could I come and at least pray for you guys? Hey, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> because I don't know what I'm doing. I, we just want to make sure this girl is okay. Right. And so Susan said, well, you know, next time you get a call, I'm going to come in and so somebody must have told her we were on the phone with Lacey. So she sort of slips in, shuts the door, and the phone just goes quiet. We had it on a speaker phone. We were talking to her, and you'd still hear that, that demon that would talk. And it was just quiet, an eerie quiet. And all of a sudden, you heard that most unhuman voice go, Susan, good to see you again. We've missed you. All right. No. At this point, something is going on that is far greater than anybody in that room, something supernatural, because nobody said Susan, nobody introduced her, she didn't talk. I mean, there was no way in the natural anybody could have known that she just stepped in and stood in the room. And I think at that point, I became a true believer that I didn't know what was going on with this little girl, but there was something supernatural that was taking place. How did Susan respond when she heard oh, herself she, called out? Yeah, she ran out of the room. She just was so much for prayers. Huh? That was yeah, the end of she, it. <laughs> she needed the prayers after that because yeah. I mean she was just freaked out that it would call her by name like that. It's it's interesting to me that you bring up a story like that, Bill, because I was at an event at the Stanley Hotel and they were doing an investigation in one of the rooms, and they were using this um, they call it the Frank's box, this radio that would scan through different frequencies, and they were communicating with something, and they they said, Dave, you've got to hear this. So I, I came into the room and I'm listening and I'm, I'm skeptical by nature, even though I, I understand that the paranormal exists, but I, I don't jump at every conclusion. And I know that people, especially listening to these audio bits, are going to make mistakes. And then they start doing roll call through the room. Can you tell me who this is? And you would hear it say Zaphis and John Zaphis was sitting there. Who is this? Wow. Patrick. And I'm like, What? And I'm thinking, okay, this is some kind of joke. Uh, one of the uh, guests that were part of our event, uh, Adam Bly, is a Roman Catholic. He is a lay exorcist and will aid in exorcisms. He came into the back of the room, and he stands there very stoic and silent. He will not engage what's going on, but he'll listen to what's going on. And at one point, I look over to him, and he reaches into his pocket, and he's got a little bottle of holy water. Mm. He's holding it in his hand, and he cups his other hand over the top of it as if like he's in a, a prayer mode. And you hear the... The voice is on the box, and all of a sudden you hear the ch -ch 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 from the radio, and then you hear, he has holy water come out of the radio. Wow. And that was the moment, much like you, that, that moment when suddenly this isn't a game now. Something's going on here. This is more than somebody pranking because there's no way. Nobody else in the room saw that. Adam was in the dark back, and I was standing very close to him when he put that holy water in his hands, and it called it out. It knew that there was holy water there. And that that moment, much like yours, that's where every hackle raised on my body. And I, I realized, oh, crap, I'm into something here. I can uh, feel that perspective for you and what you were up against. Well, you, you just know at that point, this is the real deal. Because like what you said uh, before, you know, there's a lot of people talking about it. And, you know, I, I think some of it's fake. Some of it's just misinterpreted. As to what they feel, what they, but when you see something like that, you know for a fact that there's something supernatural taking place. Right. And to be in the position now, you hear this. Are you contemplating just not answering the phone anymore now that you know that it knows who, who the players are? You know, no, I didn't. Although, you know, in hindsight, that may have been a good idea. I mean, I'm, I'm 25, 25, 26, somewhere in that area. And I just, I wanted to help this girl. There's a few folks that are joining with us. And so, of course, I don't know that most of us didn't have any clue. We just really wanted to help what we thought was a little girl that was in danger of something. Nobody was trying to be a hero. Nobody was definitely trying to get into uh, the supernatural because once you experience, you just feel the evil. You, who would want to be there on purpose? On a, on, and, uh, not me. Okay. Right. I just really wanted to help the girl. And it was the next day we, we had a concert and the radio station 
actually was a part of a church. We are in a church building, and and this church building was massive. I mean, the the main sanctuary sat like 10,000 people, so it was a football field and a half wide. That gives you sort of an idea how massive this campus was, and we had a huge concert, and she said, could I come to the concert? Absolutely. I mean, we've been all over the place trying to find this kid. Sure. And it's like, yeah, man, if you'll come to us, that's great. Well, long story short, she eventually makes it inside the church. And again, the church is huge. I mean, it, it could take 15 minutes to walk from one side to the, the other of the church. And there's a lot of people coming in. And just before she makes contact with us, we're starting to have people come up to the radio station asking where Lacey is. Okay, that's weird because we never, ever mentioned her name on the radio. This was all done behind the scenes. Mm. And, and a couple of people said, we're here to get Lacey. I don't know who they were. They were escorted out of the church because they weren't up to any good, no doubt. And but it, it, it sort of um, how how are you addressing that when you now know that uh, she is being hunted? They're they're looking for her. How do you well security those knows? People? <laughs> yeah, well, the, the security took him out of the out of the church because I mean there wasn't a whole lot they were going to do that was good if if indeed that's what they were there for. That's what right. they were saying, anyways. Right. But it became a whole lot more stressful because it's like, okay, somebody's after her, regardless of what they want to do. I don't know. I mean, it's just it really started to freak me out. Well, we got a phone call from within the church on one of our inside extensions, and it was Lacey. And she says, I'm here. Well, she'd hang up. She'd call back. She'd hang up. She'd call back. And the receptionist called me and said, who's calling you on your inside line? And I said, Stacy. And she says, all right, it's Lacey. Excuse me. And she said, Well, that's impossible because she's calling from all over the church and you can't even walk from one phone to the next in in those couple of minutes. And I'm just thinking, okay, this is just getting weirder by the minute. All right. At this point in your head, are you starting to think that maybe you're not dealing with a human? You're dealing with a demonic force that's got its way into the church now because you invited it? Yeah, I'm wondering, okay, I mean, you're wondering a lot of things, but one, is Lacey real? Right. I mean, meaning a human. I I had no clue. Well, the concert starts. All the phone calls stop. What was she saying on these phone calls? Is she playing this game with you? Yeah, she's I'm here. I'm I'm lost in the church and describe what you see. Okay, hey, you're you're close to the fountain. I'll come see you. And we just couldn't find her. And at one point she had said the last time I talked to her that night, she said, would you meet me on the porch? And they had this building behind the church called the old carpenter's home. And it used to be a retirement center for the carpenter's union. And it was a rundown building. Nobody was using it at, at that point in time. And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And of course, I told people where I was going. I'm a little on the scare side at this point. Just and a little? Well, a lot. I'm pretty <laughs> petrified. <laughs> and, you know, now to go to an abandoned building at the front porch area, which I, I don't know how far it was from the church. I mean, it was definitely within walking distance. It wasn't mm-hmm. real far. But you saw a lot of shadows because there wasn't a lot of lights on that particular building. Now, Bill, just and just to try to yeah. ask the question that I know a lot of our, our listeners probably wonder, yeah. has at any of this point, have, have any of the comments been inappropriate or sexual in nature that would? Yes. Okay, so she has offered sexual things. Not, not no. They were saying that the, the unhuman voice were, were saying different things they were going to do to her. Okay, and and then she would actually talk and say, "This is what the coven is doing to me." You know, I have. You know, they've had sex with me. They. I mean, it was just a lot of very uh, wild stuff. I mean, they, nothing was ever offered to me, but. You know, between the two, between Lacey and hearing these demonic voices there, I mean, it was um, some pretty sick stuff. And are you a married man at this point? Yes, I am. Yeah, I think I've been married a couple of years at that point. All right. Again, just trying to set the stage so people get an understanding. Because, again, I mean, you're a young guy. This is a 17, 18 year old girl who's, you know, we've got that empathetic feel to it. But then there can be this weird underlying sexual tension, especially in heightened moments of fear like this. It can instigate a lot of of really weird emotions and feelings. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around yeah, why, absolutely. why, you know, when she keeps vanishing is not there. And the idea that I'm hearing this demonic voice, you know, you're, you're a strong, powerful man, because I think at some point that phone just would not have been answered. Yeah, I just, and again, I mean, you're not trying to really dive in, I guess, to the supernatural. I just kept seeing that supposedly there was this little girl that was needing help. And I just, 
But if you're not you know, diving I, I, into the supernatural, what are you making of the voice? She's ours now, Bill. Well, I mean, I know that's a supernatural, right. but I mean, I guess I, I wasn't trying to follow after that. It was more just how do I help this little girl sure. out? You know what I mean? And when it and, would tell you of the horrific things that it was doing to her, what was your response or would you ignore it? I just ignored it. I mean, I, I don't even know what you say to something like that. Would it get more agitated because you would ignore it and only speak to her? Sometimes it would, and then it would hang up, and uh, of course it hated if anybody started to pray. So I it mean, would it hang would up just, and, and yeah. disconnect itself, or would it disconnect the entire call? The entire call. Okay. And then usually it was her that would call back, hey, what happened? I got disconnected. I said, well, no, you know, whatever is inside you, I said, hung up on us. And she goes, oh, I don't remember anything. Everything just sort of blacked out. And, uh, and I'm like, wow, this is just, uh, this is really intense. I didn't know if this happens on <clears throat> to most people that are in this kind of situation. I mean, I've never dealt with it before. Right. I mean, everything here that's happening is a first for me. And I, all but one guy that helped us the first, uh, well, during the night of the concert, I don't think anybody ever had any kind of contact with anything that was demonic like this before. You're now heading out to this old man in building to go out on the porch to meet this 17-year-old woman who's being demonically challenged and po possibly sexually and physically assaulted by a cult, and you're going by yourself. Do you feel, looking right. back at it now, do you feel like maybe you were kind of under hypnotic suggestion yourself that you were continually putting yourself into a situation that could have been extremely dangerous for you as well? You know, I don't know. I mean, I didn't feel that way. I just felt like, man, if it were my daughter, I'd want somebody to reach out mm -hmm. and, and save her. And I just, you know, of course I didn't have kids at that time, but still being married, you're, you're starting to think along those lines. And I just, yeah, I mean, and, and trust me, there was people behind me. I'd I was not going to just be the lone ranger on something like this. <laughs> um, so you didn't go out there by yourself then? You know, they were all, they stayed at the uh, the door that led out there and uh -huh. they didn't follow me. They could see me though. I sure. mean, I wasn't going to be without anybody's sight. And when I started to see the porch, I mean, I could see the figure, a shadow of, of some, somebody on the porch. And of course, my assumption, it's got to be Lacey. Nobody else is hanging out at this old abandoned building. And I just yelled to her. Lacey and I just watched her and this was one of those other I guess aha moments she just runs across the porch into this brick wall and disappears and I'm sitting there looking like did I see what I just saw I mean is this for real and when I realized indeed that was what happened she was just gone and I just turned around I ran back to the church I didn't walk I just ran back and told everybody what I had just saw. I mean, some probably thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy at that point. So then it, it makes you wonder, going back to what you said earlier, so is this a real person or not, right? Yeah, right. Because, I mean, she just disappeared. I mean, she was just gone. I couldn't see features. All I could see was a shadow because it was at nighttime. Did you hear her speak? Did you hear her breathe nope. or run? Was the sound of footfalls as she took off running? Not even footfalls. I just saw it move across the porch as though she were running and then just gone once it hit the wall. That scared me. Uh, yeah, you big wuss. Well, yeah, <laughs> let me tell you. you. Holy crap, it's scaring me. Uh, I mean, wow. I was petrified. Honestly, I was, I was petrified. There was no time over this journey that I felt like I am in control. This is no big deal. I always felt like it was a big deal, even though I didn't understand it. Hmm. That was just, yes, yeah, so I, I was petrified. I went inside. We told everybody what we saw. The phone call, call stopped for the evening. And it was later that night that Roxanne came upstairs looking for Lacey. And she was by herself and everybody and who was is down Roxanne? in the concert. Roxanne was the lady that just walked up there into, into the studio. And, you know, we know she was walking around. Not a lot of people would come up that day because a lot of times they will... If there was a concert, people would just sort of tour the station. Sure. And they could look through the windows and stuff and, and see whoever was, you know, doing their show. So that wasn't necessarily uncommon on an event like, like this. But she started asking where Lacey was. And, and there was a few of us. There's four or five of us still upstairs at, at, the, at the radio station. So we started engaging with her. All right. The Day Satan Called is the book Bill Scott is here talking to us about. It is an account of an excruciating 18-month period in his life. And we've just scratched the surface here. There's so much story to tell. 
Are you like so many others, coming into abilities that you don't understand, and unsure where to safely begin this journey of exploration? Well, award-winning psychic and medium Michelle Welch has the answers. Michelle Welch is the author of the award-winning book, The Magic of Connection. Stop cutting cords and learn to transform negative energy to live an empowered life. In this book, you'll learn how spirituality and intuition can help you heal your inner wounds while staying connected to the people that you love. Author Michelle Wells shows you how to work with the energies that connect all people, and you'll learn to transform and transmute negative energy in ways that support your personal spiritual journey and help you reach a more powerful and meaningful life. In her newest book, Spirits Unveiled, a fresh perspective on angels, guides, ghosts, and more, Michelle teaches you how to identify and deal with the spiritual energy around you every day. Each chapter features a specific kind of spirit and teaches you how to sense its presence, identify and connect with it, and set the boundaries you may need, all while demystifying the process and making it easy and accessible to everyone from the beginner to the expert. You'll learn how to understand elementals, connect with an ascended master, protect against psychic attacks, astral travel, and more. Providing meditations, visualizations, and inspiring stories, this book helps boost your intuition and spiritual experience. Unleash the real you. Get the books, The Magic of Connection, Stop Cutting Cords and Learn to Transform Negative Energy to Live an Empowered Life, and Spirits Unveiled, a fresh perspective on angels, guides, ghosts, and more. Buy them now wherever you purchase your books or by using the link on today's program guide. Life is confusing enough. Why not make it easier with award-winning help from Michelle Welch? Innovation, creation, vitality, and joy are the pulse of mysoultopia.com with many custom creations for the mind, body, and spirit along with classes, intuitive sessions, coaching, and healing energies. MySoulTopia.com strives to bring sophistication with a twist to the metaphysical and the holistic market while raising the community's vibration and channeling the new paradigm, which means new and exciting adventures for all. MySoulTopia.com is utopia for your soul. Visit MySoulTopia.com, your one-stop shop for all your metaphysical needs. Offering hand-selected crystals and crystal jewelry with prices to fit every budget. MySoulTopia.com offers the best selections of tarot and divination cards by top designers. Expertly curated and award-winning book collections from top authors on every subject you'll need on your spiritual journey. My Soultopia is also proud to offer the finest singing bowls and an eclectic collection of the most amazing gemstones, crystals, and crystal jewelry from the top metaphysical designers in the world. MySoultopia.com is always your one-stop shop for award-winning mixes of Florida water, sage spray, and other spiritual protection. So begin your journey with the best resource, MySoulTopia.com. That's MySoulTopia.com. Why mess with the rest when you can start with the best? MySoulTopia.com. Again, that's M-Y-S-O-U-L-T-O-P-I-A.com. All right, Bill, we need to know. First of all, you start getting phone calls at the radio station. This girl's begging for help. She is a sex slave of some creepy cult. While you're talking to her, a demonic dark voice keeps overlaying and chatting to you. While she was speaking, did the voice ever overlay her as though the two voices were speaking at once? Or were they always separate? It was always separate. It almost sounded like she was gagging and then she would go into this voice. But when she was in that demonic voice, there were times you could actually hear a couple of things talking. You never heard, but it was things that just weren't human. You could hear because sometimes it would even scream. Like if you started praying, it got real agitated. And so, yeah, I guess once it was under the, the demonic side of things, sometimes you would hear a couple of different things or you'd hear more than one scream at a time. And Did it was it just know I, things I, about you or or your coworkers. 
what you know it knew Susan when she came in the room to pray would it start taunting you and and say things specifically about Bill Scott to try to unnerve you and scare you off from helping no I mean there were definitely things it would try to scare you through intimidation you know do you realize you're a mere mortal do you have any idea what you're dealing with well that's a great question <laughs> it was like yeah I mean I get it right I mean that you're you're dealing with the supernatural in any of those times i said it's not me you have to deal with it's jesus it's god you got to deal with him not me i mean i i, I just look at you delegating i, I had a healthy well fear done. yeah you should right this thing is creepy all right it's calling out it's it's uh it's being uh overtly sexual in some of the conversations it's being threatening during conversations she seems to black out in these moments where she has no recollection of what happened or uh what's going on did she ever describe, does she believe that she was impregnated with the devil during this cult practices? She didn't say that. She said, you know, she told me that she had sacrificed uh, babies, that she was a breeder. And I honestly, I have no way to prove whether that was true or not true. I mean, even to this day, those are things that were said to me that she said that she was forced to do over the time that she'd been involved with this coven. And her dad is the one that brought her to it when she was a little girl. Uh, again, according to uh, what she's telling me. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, I learned a, a lot of things that can happen and satanic sacrifices and stuff. Cause I, you know, I asked people that were more involved, like, detectives at the time that uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, I knew a guy and he's like, yeah, some of these things can happen. Now, whether they did with her or not, I don't know. But she talked about sacrificing babies and a breeder, basically, as you know, is just somebody who has a baby and it's undocumented. So therefore, if the baby is sacrificed, nobody even knows it's gone, right? Wow. That's uh, that's absolutely chilling. Absolutely. Yeah, chilling. I mean, now it wasn't was, that it was during the, I never dreamed of that, that was during the heat of kind of the satanic panic in the United States, too. Right. During yes. the 80s. Yeah, that was right smack dab because some police forces in uh, major cities and stuff, they actually had some units that were looking into a lot of the satanic stuff. So, yeah, that was right during the height of everything, uh, satanically speaking, in, in the 80s. OK, you go to meet this girl, confront her finally on the porch of the old wooden house behind the behind the church you see her she takes off running vanishes through a brick wall what happens after that i mean you you return back quickly realizing yeah, yeah real quick you, realizing that now you're really in this over your head how does she go from a ghost-like shadowy apparition to human form in your world well you know we don't hear from lacy after that, for that particular night, what we did see was Roxanne, another lady coming up saying she was looking mm -hmm. for Lacey and it was just her by herself. And so we started talking with her and she's, well, I, I'm supposed to bring her back. And it, it sort of lined up to what Lacey was saying. And I'm like, well, you know, you can't have Lacey and, and we're trying to help her. I had never seen anybody in person that could speak with a man's voice. I mean, that lady's eyes, I remember just rolled in the back of her head. And we start hearing the same stuff that we did on the phone. You can't have her. She belongs to us talking about Lacey. And I just honestly, I felt like I'd stepped into some sort of cheap whore flick. I wasn't even certain how we got to this point. Now we've got this lady in front of us, eyes rolling in the back of her head. And if she did look at you, her eyes were so dark. I don't even know how to explain it. It's just her eyes were dark. The whole, when you the hear whole sclera or just the, the color iris part and the pupil? Just the whole thing was dark. It was just a, it was hard to explain, but you, you could tell it wasn't her that was looking at you. Right. And again, you feel evil. I mean, you really feel evil when you come face to face with something like this. Well, I, I didn't know what to do. There was a guy that was there. He says, well, we can pray over. And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm behind you the whole way. Maybe two or three people behind you. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I was not the front man on, on praying for this girl. And. You know, we, we we went for hours. We talked. She'd scream. I mean, she would just, you'd hear men voices come out of her. And it this was, is Roxanne. And this is Roxanne. And it's right there. I mean, I'm watching this with my own eyes. I had no clue uh, up until 
now that this could even take place with an individual. I mean, the, the closest thing I've ever heard of anything where some missionary coming to our church said they were in some village in Africa and saw somebody that was demon possessed. I mean, that is as far as I've ever heard anything right. uh, in regards to that. And here I'm seeing it. I mean, she was just evil. There's now, no other way. Were you to, ever to considering explain. while you're talking to Roxanne that maybe this really is Lacey? You know, no, I didn't believe it or not. I never put the two together and you know, after she left the next morning, Lacey started calling and then Roxanne started calling. And the guy that was at the front desk said to Roxanne, how do you know Lacey? And she said, well, Lacey lives inside of me. So he calls me and tells me that. And I'm thinking, OK, as soon as you don't think this thing can get any more weird, mm -hmm. it does. And she said, Roxanne's coming back up to the church. So it wasn't just me. It was always like five or six of us that were trying to help her. So we went back trying to think, well, what do you mean Lacey uh, inside of her, what, what she had said? And I'll never forget. She got up there and we're talking with her and she goes, well, Lacey's lived inside of me for years. And I'm thinking, I guess that would make sense going back to the porch that we weren't dealing with a human. I mean, I felt as though we were because Lacey sounded like a little girl, right? A little scared girl. It wasn't anything that you, would have gone, hey, that sounds demonic. But then you think, okay, she's all over the church making phone calls where you couldn't walk from point A to point B uh, in that time. We could never find her when we go to phone booths. When I did see her on the, the, the porch of the carpenter's home, she ran and then disappeared. And, of course, all I saw was a shadow, and that would make sense that that's all that there was. And so things are now starting to click in my head. Lacey's not even a real human. It's Roxanne that has been making the phone calls. You can see how it starts twisting your brain. You're thinking, what in the world are we dealing with? And at that point, Roxanne, and, and that's like, what you're I, thinking. I want help. Yeah, that's yeah, what you're that's thinking. What I'm thinking. At that point, I'm thinking, hey, I wonder if the movie theaters are hiring. <laughs> well, because I'm not working you. there anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm out the door, just, Bill. Wow. <laughs> it was weird. And, and I, I remember uh, somebody started praying over Roxanne. And all of a sudden, there was that little girl voice. Oh, no. And she goes, Bill. I mean, you could hear it. I mean, it, it was Lacey. I mean, it was this little girl. Because she just, it was a very unique, scared little girl voice. She just looked up and says, Bill, you told me you love me. You told me that you would help me, that this place was going to be safe. And now you're praying against me. Why would you do that? I, it took me a minute to begin to really even think straight. Because really, the last three days, we were doing everything we could to help Lacey, the scared little girl who thought people were out to get her. I mean, that was the only reason we did what we did, was to help Lacey. And now I'm seeing that... Lacey's not even real. You know, going from three days before, not even having any encounter and anything supernatural on the dark side like this to all of a sudden you're peeling all these different layers. You keep going deeper and deeper, you know, and I said, well, Roxanne, what, what do you want to do? She goes, I, I, I want Lacey to leave. I said, well, you tell her to leave. And man, there was screaming. Her eyes were rolling in the back of her head. It was like something you would see, I guess, uh, on a movie theater kind of a deal. It was just, except for it's right there in front of you. And again, you feel the evil. I, I don't know how many times I've said that, but it's just, I don't know how else to explain it. You, it, it you're, you're watching this abnormal thing take place in front of you. But it's more than just even seeing that, although that would be enough for me, Dave. Yeah. But, but just feel I didn't need all the extras, but no. feeling the evil. Uh -huh. It was almost like somebody would turn down the thermostat. I mean, I don't think the temperature actually went down, but there is a coldness to evil. And right. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it before in dealing with the show. There is a coldness to evil and you could feel it just engulf the room. That's, uh, yeah, that's absolutely a great and uh, very theatrical telling of it. I think everybody can feel that themselves listening to a story like this. You've now come to a very frightening realization. She's, she's calling out to you. She's needing your help as this little girl's voice is pulling out of this adult woman who is also regaling you with this creepy male, masculine, demonic voice. Are you thinking, you know, time to call Bellevue? We need to get her <laughs> psychological counseling and locked up. 
Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking something has to take place. We've got to get her help. Well, you know, who? Wh- wh- who do you call? What do you call? There's not a lot of people that want a whole lot to, d- to do with this in my circle of friends. Right. <laughs> which maybe they were the smarter ones between the two. <laughs> and, you know, she's like, I, I really want my life on track. I, I don't want to go back to... But who's saying uh, this to you, Roxanne? Th- this was Roxanne, yeah. She's I don't want to go back to the people that I was with and you know, I, I, I wanna I don't want this in my life anymore. And I'm like, Well, you know, we wanna help you. There's gotta be somebody that can take you in and and I knew it would take a few days to find someone. And, you know, I, I honestly, Dave, and you know, of course I'm I'm fifty three, I was twenty five or so then and <laughs> I had a big heart. Uh, but a really small brain at the time. And I think just my my passion to help somebody overtook any good kind of common sense because I'll never forget telling her, well, why don't you come home with me and, and my wife and you stay with us until we can find somebody to take you in an organization because I figured there's got to be somebody that can take her in and begin to help her out. Bill, you you have to realize now, especially in hindsight, you were under the oppression as well. You were being reeled into this thing because oh yeah, I, nobody I was in their in. right mind, nobody no. in their right mind would think this is creepy as hell. Hey, you should come home with me and my wife. You know, you say it like that, it just sounds so much different. <laughs> well, it, I don't know how else to look at it, Bill. I mean, there's no, a certain line that right. you you know. And hey, listen, we love to help people. And we help people on the show as often as we possibly can. Sure. But the minute your eyes start rolling back and you're talking to me as a little girl in one breath, an adult woman in another, and a, a sexually nasty, demonic voice in the third, not at my house. <laughs> and I tell people this. That was really a stupid choice on my behalf. I mean, one, you, you need to protect your home. I don't yes. care if you're single well, living you're by yourself the or evil you know, in. family. Yeah, you you just don't do that. I mean, I had a really big heart. I wanted to see her get help. I wasn't thinking straight and I should have never done it cuz I remember we got home while my wife was, you know, she found out later I'd made the decision. She was not on board <laughs> with it. Hey, hon, we got company. Um, actually, we got a whole group. <laughs> Wait a minute. Your uh, wife wasn't on board with you bringing home a psychotic woman with multiple personality disorder? Uh, well, <laughs> some wives, huh? You just can't get past them. Like, on, oh, have a heart. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, and, and, you know, we get home. And, of course, now, I mean, we just got this little duplex. It's a two-bedroom deal. So it's not like there's a whole lot of space, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget the first night. We, we put her in the guest bedroom, the only other bedroom we had, and we went in our bedroom and locked the door. I mean, we're scared. I mean, she has told us about all sorts of th- stuff from baby sacrifices to right so much ungodly stuff. And I do remember walking past her bedroom in the hallway one, uh, th- one evening or that evening, not one evening, but that evening. And you could hear voices coming from the room. There was more than one person in there. And people asked, did you knock on the door or open it. And I said, no, (laughs) I did not want to know. Obviously she was entertaining and was a little busy at the time. Yeah. And I just, you know, who am I to interrupt? And I just, I didn't (laughs) want to know what I had seen so far. Right. Honestly had blown me away. I didn't want to deal with anything more. So we went to bed that night, but I mean, we locked our door and because we didn't know if we were safe or not. And she stayed with us. It was a couple of weeks before we could get an organization to agree to let her in. And we found an organization. So I'll never forget. We took her and we sat down. The people are interviewing her and I was sitting there. My wife was sitting there. And I said, by the way, I I feel like I got to be honest. I said, "Um, she's possessed. (laughs) Well, (laughs) Yeah, you, you can imagine you, the Bill. response. This is, yes. <laughs> okay. The guy's just writing stuff down in the notes. We may have two people to admit by the end of this session, you know. She might be possessed and she really doesn't like holy water. How did uh, um, how did they respond immediately to that? Was it kind of a laugh and a, and a arched eyebrow or did they Yeah, just sort of an arch eyebrow. And he goes, "Well, you know, we deal with all types here. You know, we got we have homeless people that come and drug users and prostitutes and and we are able to walk with them. But I mean, they were not willing to acknowledge, you know, and I said, well, no, I'm talking like she's possessed. Things are inside her. And they just looked at me as though I was crazy. And I thought, okay, hey, I was honest. I said it. We'll we'll just pull back because I was afraid they wouldn't take her. And they didn't believe me, of course. Okay. And 
So they said, yeah, she could, she could stay. And I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. So I, we dropped her off, which was a wonderful moment after spending a couple of weeks and really the hell that we had walked through. Was she upset that I, you were leaving her behind? No, she was okay. She says, I want to do what it takes to be on a road to recovery. And I'm like, these are the people. They'll do it. And I think you had to make it, I think it was like six weeks before they could have any visitors. And she, she asked if we'd come visit because she didn't have any family. And right. I said, well, yeah, we, we can come visit you. I mean, I think you got an hour once every few weeks after that. And, and so we did a couple of times. But I remember driving home thinking, it's over. We made it. It's over. It's done. It just felt good. Felt like we could let our guard down and started to process or at least try to process what we had seen. I mean, I called my dad, who was a pastor. He was scratching his head. <laughs> He's like, I remember him telling me a few times, son, if it were anybody else telling me this story, I would think you were nuts. And what, you know, I appreciate his support. Um, but even he was just sort of scratching his head as to what we had seen and heard and went through. Well, we get home. We had a wonderful evening. Actually, the first relaxed evening in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And we went to bed. And of course, you're, you're, your mind's still trying to process everything you've seen because it challenges everything you believe. Right. It's like, okay, there's this whole nother world out there. I mean, I'm religious as far as I believe in God and Jesus and all that kind of stuff. And I, yeah, uh, you know, there's, there's good, there's bad, there's God, there's Satan. But I mean, can you really interact with the dark side? I'd never, I guess I would have probably told you no before then. Not so much after that event. So I'm, I'm processing it. And we laid down to go to bed and I started getting real scared and I could feel evil. I'm assuming it's just everything's catching up from the last three weeks. Right. Everything I saw. Right. And so I didn't say anything. I just laid there in bed and you could feel it getting more and more strong. All of a sudden, the bathroom light turns on. I cannot tell you how scared I was. And my wife's like, what just happened? I said, I don't know. I said, I could feel evil. She's I could too. She says, I thought maybe I was just being scared. And I thought that's exactly what I thought. She goes, you, you, gotta, you need to get up and go turn the light off. I said, not a chance. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I was never the brave one through this. I said, we can pray from the bed, but it, the light stays on. And so, Bill, I think you and I might be long lost brothers. Yeah. You can get I'm, up and go I'm turn that light off. You. Oh, no, I can't. Why don't you do it? Yeah. If you want to do it, that's fine. Oh. Right about now, I think I want every light on in the house. <laughs> yes. Every night we'd go to bed, you could feel that doors would open and close. You could hear them slamming. Lights were on and off. Oof. Um, one night I could feel something hitting my foot and I'm asking my wife, said, are you like kicking my foot or something? And I knew the answer would be no, but I had to ask her. And I said, there is something hitting my foot. I mean, it felt like somebody was at the end of the bed, just slapping my foot with their hand. And of course, all the lights would come on. I remember one night we ran out at two 30 in the morning and just left the house to go to a friend's house, a couple doors down so we could sleep. We were that scared. And you could always feel the evil before. Well, we finally had some friends that said, you know, why don't we come and cleanse your house? And I'm like, what do you mean by that? They said, well, let us just pray over it and and we'll just command anything to go. And I'm like, OK, I mean, right. I had never seen anybody do that, but I was I'm, I'm very wide open to whatever it would take to make our house normal again. Right. And we were scared. Sure. And they, they would do that the next night. It would happen. They came a couple of times and I'll never forget towards the end of this. It lasted. It was probably about two or three weeks. I was laying there and I could feel something very evil. And it just felt like it kept getting closer and closer. And I'm not saying anything. And my wife sits up. She looks at the end of the bed, which we had a big, a mirror on top of a dresser and she could see down the hallway behind me and she lay down. She got up, she lay down third time. She gets up. I said, what do you see? She says, I'm dreaming. I said, no, you're wide awake. What do you see? She said, there is a black figure walking towards our bedroom. I can't even tell you how scared I got at that point. And I said, I'm just going to start praying that God will protect us. And because uh, there was not a chance I was getting up 
She says, you know, as you're praying, it's backing up. So I just prayed and finally she says, it's gone. So we got up, turned every light on in the house. We're in the living room. She's in tears. We hadn't slept well and, uh, and we're scared out of our mind. And I remember her starting to doze off on the couch and I'm just sitting there because I couldn't sleep. I was just too scared after that. And it was the only time I ever saw anything, Dave. I mean, and I saw this shadow in our, in our hallway and it was just a shadow. There was nothing, no, no features or anything like that. And I remember standing up and I walked to the hallway and I, I think it was just out of pure desperation. Trust me, it wasn't because I, I was brave. And I just said, why are you in my house? And like we're talking here, it just simply said, I'm an invited guest into your home. Well, those are words you don't want to hear. Nope. And I just said, you need to leave in Jesus' name. And I, it, it turned around. It walked down the hallway and just faded out. Before I did that, I, I do remember I asked this. This is a key part. I said, why? In, I said, in Jesus' name, why do you feel you're, you're a guest in my home? And it just simply said, have you looked underneath Roxanne's bed, meaning the guest bedroom bed? Oh, no. And I said, go. And it, it left. And I went directly to her bed. And I looked underneath. And there were all these satanic, satanic like rings. There was a black cape that I don't know what she used for. But there was a lot of just satanic jewelry and, and junk underneath the bed. Not a lot. But I took it out. Man, I didn't know what to do with it. So I, man, I smashed some of it, some of it. I put it on the grill and I burned. And I just wanted everything out. I'm desperate. And the only thing we had left was her car in our driveway. And I thought, I want that off my property. Right. I don't want anything thinking that it's an invited guest into my house. And this time my wife is up because, you know, the barbecue is going at 2.30 in the morning. And uh, she sees me getting rid of this stuff. I get in the car God is my witness. You could feel that there was something in the back seat. You could feel that evil. And I'm, I just kept saying to myself, do not look in the rearview mirror. Oh. Now, whether I would have saw something or not, I don't know. But I could feel it. And I was so scared. I, I was going to take the uh, car about two houses down to had like a little cul-de-sac field. Right. I was going to park it there. I had one leg out of the door, the door open as I'm driving it. So at any minute, I can just bail. Right. <laughs> I'm telling you, there was something in that car. I mean, I ran back to the house. And while we lived in that particular duplex, that was the last thing that actually happened. Everything went back to normal after that, which was awesome. I mean, we're still going to go see Roxanne from time to time just for a quick visit, but that was no big deal. But the house, I mean, you could feel there was no evil left. Nothing happened. No doors open, closed. It was, it was done. And that felt absolutely amazing. Well, it wasn't, my guess is maybe a, a couple of weeks after that, I got a phone call from the organization that took Roxanne in at night. And they said, things are going crazy here. She's possessed. Well, I told them. And, and and now they're believing me, and she's like, her eyes are rolled in the back of her head. So there's all these voices coming out of her. They said, uh, there's things looking in the window that are not human. I have no. no idea what they saw, but these people were freaked out. Now, these were the ones that didn't believe, right? Right. And they are freaked out on the phone. They said, there are things that are literally jumping on the girls at night. It was a ladies' shelter rehab place. And said, there's something physically jumping on the ladies. And they said, would, would you come out and, and talk to us? And I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. I mean, so we ended up going out because I didn't want her to kick Roxanne out of the program. Because I didn't want her back. I mean, it was far better to deal with it from a distance like this. And, and they were very, very scared about what was going on and they, they agreed to keep her and you know I don't know what they did during the days with her they were working with her on on different things but that was a weird night a very scary night for them and when I got there things had already started calming down so I, I didn't see anything other than the fact that Roxanne was speaking with multiple voices and some people Dave will, will say and and rightfully so well maybe she just has a multiple personality disorder right right and 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 I get that, and 
you know, I'm, I'm sure that can happen. That's I don't ha- t- really take issue with that. But I don't think that personalities usually leave the body and walk around the house and turn lights on and off and shut the doors. And that's uh, your multiple personalities don't jump out of you and start bounding on the other women in the place. Exactly. So could she have some mental issues? Well, absolutely. She probably did going through the abuse that she did with her father and the occult. If all that were true, what she was saying, yeah, she probably some real mental issues that she had to deal with. But this is far beyond somebody dealing with multiple personalities. And so, you know, I'm I'm intrigued as to what's going on. And I remember getting in her car and I just looked to see if there was anything that would give us a clue. And I found a book and it had a lot of dates, names in it and addresses. And I thought, what in the world? So I, I just picked a name and decided to call. And I, I honestly thought more than likely, it'd probably be somebody that was in her coven or something. And of course, I don't think there was any even caller ID back in 88. And so I wasn't real worried about the person knowing who was calling. So I called and this guy answers. He was in Indiana. I'll never forget it. And uh, it was an older guy. And I said, uh, do you know Roxanne? And he got real quiet. He goes, do you have her? Well, I got quiet because I wasn't certain why he was asking this. And I said, well, sort of. I said, who are you? And he says, well, I'm a pastor of some some church in Indiana. And I'm like, well, this is weird. Right. And because uh, I expected a, a witch, a warlock or something. <laughs> and uh, he goes, uh, Roxanne had been here. And I'm like, OK. He goes, do you know what you're doing? I said, no, sir, I don't. I said, now she's in this rehab place. And I go visit her, but I said, I have no clue. He goes, he says, I have dealt with this kind of thing, I think he said, for 20 years. He said, I have never seen anybody with demons so powerful in all my life. He says, you need to be very careful. And he said, I'll tell you two stories. I said, all right. He said, she stayed with us in our home for a couple of nights, and then we got her bus ticket and sent her home to where she was from. She said the night before she left, he says, my wife and I were in our bedroom was at night, decided to pray for her. And, and she, he said, our house began to shake. He says, I'm, I'm talking physically shake to where pictures came off the wall when we started praying for her. And he said, another time after Roxanne was already home, a couple of states away, he says, my board and I got together and we decided to go ahead and pray. And we said, you know, Lord, just bless Roxanne. And he said, the church began to shake. And he said, we audibly heard a voice that said, why do you torment me so? Well, this guy's not encouraging me at all, okay? <laughs> like, there is some powerful things inside of Roxanne. And he asked me, he says, have you encountered a demon named Abaddon? And I said, I don't think so. He goes, you'd know. Because if you ever get that far, he says, she's going to disappear. She'll just be gone. I was like, all right. Well, I just didn't know what to say to that. And he said, well, feel free to keep my number. He said, if you need to call. And I said, all right. And I'm conveying all this to my wife. I'm like, how weird is this? That she was with this pastor a couple years ago. And, and I went through the book and called a few people. And it was amazing. Everywhere she went, there seemed to be... Uh, a lot of damage. People get divorced. Uh, churches would split. There were some people that had committed suicide. Others had died. I mean, it was, you just saw a path of destruction. And and I'll never forget one time after that, reading through the Bible and in Revelation, where it talks about Abaddon being the destroyer. And I was like, wow, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any clear answer, but it was one of those moments where you just reflected thinking all the places she had gone, right. there was all that disaster. And here the Bible says Abaddon is the destroyer. And so that, that was a big deal. And only one time during that time did I ever have an encounter with Abaddon. I'll never forget. It was at that the place that she was staying at towards the end. And I was sitting talking to her on a picnic table. It was just a nice warm day. And I looked at her and I was shocked because she was just sort of swaying back and forth, almost like a snake would. And her eyes were real, you know, just sort of squinting. And I had felt so much evil over the course of, at that point, about 
probably 10 months, it seemed to be very small compared to what was happening at that picnic table that day. All she said, and I said, she, it was actually the demon, and I believe it was Abaddon, just finally said, you found me. And better men than you have tried to get rid of me. I never said a thing. I just, the the level of evil was so, I, I just, everything I had seen up to that point didn't even come close. And I just felt like I needed to keep my mouth shut. I did, and that that was the only time that I, I know of. Once anyways. you have the name of the demon, isn't it easier to rid yes, yourself of it? It is. It is. But you know, even in one place in the Bible, it <clears throat> talks about some are so powerful. It takes fasting and praying and multitudes praying over that. You know what I mean? Right. And I figured, well, that guy said this was a pretty powerful. <laughs> demon and and I thought it's it's just me and I'm I'm just not going to attempt it. I I honestly feared for my safety. Yeah, you should. By the level of of evil that I felt and you know during that time every once in a while people would call saying that they were looking for Lacey still and I'll never forget and you know I'm not at, at that point my dream was not to dive in and and live the rest of my life in the paranormal like this or become an exorcist or anything like that. that not at all but i had a church call me once during this time and they said hey we, we had heard through a friend that you know how to deal with people that are possessed well i said you heard wrong i mean i <laughs> i don't know really that much I, i've been sucked into this but i am far from an expert and they're like we don't know anything and we've got this young lady at our church right now speaking in multiple voices and we don't even know what to do would you please come immediately and i said no they said no we really we, we know nothing so i ended up going And I thought, well, maybe I can at least be supportive because we didn't get a lot of support. You know, I think most people just didn't want anything to do with it, which I I totally get, especially in hindsight. Right. And so I picked up my little brother who thought I was crazy at this point. And I said, we just ride with me. I said, hey, I said, let's just support these folks and we'll go home. We're not going to be there very long. And I don't know how old the girl was. She looked like she was about 18 or 19. And I got there and they ended up pushing me right in front of her and said, here, deal with her. Well, that was not what I went for. I'll never forget her looking at me and her eyes rolling in the back of her head. This man's voice came out and said, we're getting sick and tired of you looking at me. And I'm thinking, I don't get it. What do you mean? Because I'd never met this girl before having to do with her. And, you know, Bill Scott's my radio name. It's my first and middle name. And it called me out by my legal last name, which nobody in that room knew except for my little brother. And it said, we've had it. We want Roxanne back. So we are going to kill you and your wife. Man, I'll never, I just, I was scared. I mean, it knew my name. It knew Roxanne. The whole thing was just too eerie for me. And, and I just said, you know, no. And, uh, and, and people started praying, which I appreciated. And it was, it was pretty mad. I mean, it spit in my face, which was really gross. Right. And I'll never forget it. Just look, I mean, you were eyeball to eyeball. We're only like six inches away. And I'll just never forget it saying, do you have any idea what you're dealing with? Because you're nothing than a mere mortal. Second time I've heard that. But boy, when you're face to face, and and I got that. I said, well, it's not me you have to deal with. It's God. And I'll never forget these words as long as I live. He said, true. One day my tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and my knee will bow. Today is not that day. Holy cow. Anyways, long story short on that, after they got done praying, somebody took the lady home just for the night so they could get her taken care of. Well, she starts calling me at the radio station, this this girl, and she goes, oh, I want to be religious. I don't want to. Good for you. I don't need somebody else to deal with. I already have <laughs> Roxanne, right? And I right. said, good for you. You're, you're, you're with good company. The church is going to help you out. She called day after day. She says, I'm getting baptized this Saturday. Would you come? No. I said, I'm, I'm fine. I, I really wanted to keep my distance and, and not get involved. And finally, the last time she called, I said, you know, honestly, I, I can't come. I wish you well. And she got really mad. And she goes, I was sent here to kill you. 
I can't take this. She hung up the phone, walked out of the people's house, and they never saw her again. Well, that scared me. I'm thinking, well, who would even want to hurt me? Right. And, you know, and it was all over Roxanne. And and that was really, I mean, that was the only time somebody had ever threatened that. We'd had some bomb threats at the church a couple of times that we wondered if it wasn't related to that as well. You could tell somebody wanted Roxanne back. And, at, you know, if you're not dumb enough the first time, this proves that I'm, I was really not thinking well. When she got done with the, the rehab, it was like, uh, I think it was 10 months that she was there. She got out, but she had to have somebody pick her up. So my wife and I went to go pick her up, brought her back to our house, then to get her an apartment. And so she was only at the house for a short period of time because we just weren't going to allow her just to live with us. We helped her get set up with an apartment. She was able to buy just a were things, of a car. And were things somebody, calmed down with her after her, her no, stint? No, they weren't. That, that was the thing. I thought we were bringing her home and we wouldn't have that issue anymore. Even for those small times she was at the house, it all started up again as far as her and the way that she was speaking and, and, and these things coming out of her verbally. And I'm thinking, what in the world? And somebody said, well, you need to now take her to a therapist, counselor, therapist. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I, I said, that's fine. I said, we'll even pay for it. So I remember we did. And I sat down with a the therapist before they got started. I said, I want you to know, as you counsel her and work with her, She's possessed. Well, it didn't go over real well. I think they thought I was probably the one that needed counseling, right. which I probably did on some level. Sure. I mean, here I am. I brought her back home for the second time, but they didn't believe me. And I remember one of the sessions, I'd wait out in the lobby, of course, and uh, he came back and got me. And it was our last session together, but she had gone nuts in the, uh, in the session with men voices starting speaking back to the counselor, therapist, and he had never experienced that before. And he didn't have any answers for it other than the fact that he wasn't going to see her again. He was scared. And, and, and he had the right to be. You could feel the evil in the room. Hmm. And he just like, this is so far beyond me. We're just not going to have any more sessions. And I'll never forget. I mean, you know, this is, man, I mean, you're tired after 18 months of all this going on. And, and, and I mean, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of details that I put in the book because we don't have time to go through the whole book here. I remember I was at somehow, I don't even know how, I was at a pastor's house overnight. Uh, it was a friend of mine. It was actually her husband. And they invited me in, said, you know, you're a couple hours from home, spend the night, leave tomorrow. I said, that's cool. So I, I sit down with this guy and I'm just sharing the story of what's going on and what had gone on. And he goes, you know, I think I know what's going on. Well, I've wanted to hear that for the last 18 months. Right. And I said, well, what do you, what do you feel is going on? He says, I know sometimes it seems even beyond supernatural power. And I said, yeah, it does. And he says, I really, he says, yes, she's possessed. There's no doubt. But he says, I really think she's playing you and they're playing you. And it really is to get your eyes off of your life and your calling, whatever God's called you to do. And, and they're, at, they're after you. They're not after her. They already got her. And he says, you know, it's to destroy your marriage. It's just, this is something you don't need to be involved in. You need to walk away. And I was like, you know, it sounds like he really knows what he's talking about. I shared it with my wife. She agreed. So we decided to go ahead. We were going to call Roxanne and just tell her, you know, we just we need to cut ties. You know, we've, we've got you started and all will be good. And before I could even call her, she pulls in the driveway. She knocks on the door and I answer it and I'm like, yeah. And she's like, uh, I'm out of here. And I'm like, what do you mean you're out of here? I'm gone. It's over. And nobody had ever told her, uh, at least not me or not nobody human anyways. And, and I said, you know, we do care about you. And she says, I'm just gone. And she got in her car and drove off. You know, you, you felt pretty bad over the whole, whole thing. You didn't know how to process it. Uh, you know, cause what we did, we just did out of a good heart. Now, would I do that again? No, there's not a chance. You know, you, you have to have some common sense, which I was lacking in a huge proportion back in the day. But we saw so much evil during that time to give you a glimpse of, is there another world out there? Well, yeah, there is. And it is very real. Just because you don't see it on a regular basis doesn't mean it's not real. I mean, I can remember, I, I can remember one story. We were, after we got uh, Roxanne 
out of that rehab center. I, I told her that, you know, some of the things that were underneath the bed caused that to be an invited guest, that, that demon. And she goes, well, I got a lot of stuff back at my home, which was about a 10 hour drive away. She goes, maybe I should destroy all that and cut all my ties. I'm thinking, well, that's a great idea. Right. I said, I, let's, we'll take the drive this weekend. Anything to help you out? Well, when I was at work that day, uh, my telephone line rang and I answered it was a request line. And it was that demon. It was an unhuman voice that says, you will never make it to crush that stuff. We can not allow you to do that. I hung up on it. The next line went. Uh, it was him. I hung up. All 10 of my request lines were going at the same time. It was him on every single line, which really freaked me out. And the only time I really joked about this was then I I looked at one of the secretaries came in and I told her what had just happened because it was pretty wild. I mean, you're not going to be able to jam somebody's all 10 lines, one, one individual. And I said, you know what? If he's that big, bad, bold and sassy, why doesn't he just bring the stuff to the house and I don't have to make the drive? And while she was standing there, I answered the phone again. And it said, I heard what you said, your wish is my command, and hung up. And I thought, what have I done? And I'll never forget getting home that night. And I went into the garage for something, and there was a pile of jewelry in the middle of my garage. And it was satanic jewelry. And I asked Roxanne, I had her come take a look at it, and she goes, that's my stuff. The next day, my, my request line rings again, and it was that same demon that said, did you see what I brought to your garage? Do you want me to bring the rest of the stuff? And I was like, no, in Jesus' name, no. And I just hung up on it. So do I think it's real? Yeah, I really do. I haven't told a lot of people up until the book came out. And I didn't write it down for a book. Literally just wrote it down to get it out of my head and onto paper. My wife just thought that would probably be good. You don't tell this to a lot of people because they think you're nuts. And I don't know. I think if I were listening right now to your program, I'd wonder if this were true or not. And and honestly, I, I don't do a lot of interviews. I mean, you know that. I, right. I know you've been trying to get me on the show for the last year or so. And I just I just don't. I mean, I've done probably two interviews in the last couple of years. It's just weird to even hear myself talk about this because it is so real and you sort of relive some of it. And, exactly. you know, I try to make light in some areas only because it's such a heavy subject. Right. And once she once she left, once she confronted the fact that she was done, and left, was that pretty much it for you? Were you able to break free from whatever these things were attaching to your yes. home and life? Yeah, we we did okay after that. I've only had one encounter in the last twenty years, just and it was just a just a little bump in the road with somebody. It wasn't a big deal, so you know nothing really has has taken place and. Hadn't talked to her until I had written it all, all of it down and on, on paper. And a friend of mine picked it up and said, can I go read this? Oh, I don't care. You can read it. Well, he ended up saying, I've got a friend that would like to read it. Well, he ended up being an agent. And he's like, you know, I, I think we need to get this out. And I was like, okay. And, uh, and so we did. And, and when we got it all done, the publisher said, you have to have her sign off on this. Even though names have been changed in states. Because she's not a public figure. If she can prove it's her, you could be in trouble. And I'm thinking, well, that's the last thing I want to do is find right. her. Right, exactly. I mean, this many years later, and I, I thought, okay, I got to. And I told my wife, I said, well, I know the state that she used to live in in the city. She was what we call the churches in that area because she always seems to show up at a church. I said, all right. And, he, of course, she comes back. She's got like 300 church names. I'm like, are we really do this? And she goes, yeah. And I said, okay. And the first church my wife calls, they go, yeah, Roxanne goes here. Out of all 300 churches wow. that we were about to call, and within a few minutes, Roxanne was calling my cell phone. I have to tell you, I was scared as to what we were going to find. And fortunately, we found, uh, I was going to say a young lady, she's not so young, that seemed to be doing pretty good. She was involved in a church, has been for five years, talked to the pastor. They love her. And she recently got married over the last year for the first time. And so it seems as though she's doing really okay. Okay. And and she did reconfirm when we were talking just a little bit. We didn't really dive into a lot of the past. I didn't want to, I just didn't want to go there. I just right. Why shared reopen it? what right. we had done and would she sign off so we could share the story. But she says, you know, I can still remember as a little girl, my dad taking me to that satanic coven. 
And that's when it all began. And she's that just destroyed my life as I'm still trying to put it back together again. But I found good people and a good church to be involved in and, and, and people who love me. And I, I thought, well, that's really cool. And, uh, and we, we don't have regular conversation back and forth. It's very rare, but it, it seems like she was doing okay. Cause it was funny at first that, you know, the, the, the publisher didn't like the fact that she drove away and that was the end of the story. Right. <laughs> They're like, that ain't a good story. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's a true story. I'm not sure what to do. Right. That's the way it ended. As I was writing the last chapter, I was able to say, you know, this book began with a phone call. As crazy as it seems, 20 years later, it ends with a phone call. She's on the phone right now. And so I was able to paint a little bit better of a picture of where she is today, which I thought that was really cool that it happened that way. That was a God thing is just because it was going to be the fact that she just pulled out of the driveway and that was the end of story. But, you know, I, I look back and, and I talked about how the places she had been were destroyed, right? That that church today that was at, at the time back in 88, 89 was the biggest church in North America uh, is a piece of grass today. There's no building, no walls, nothing. Wow. It's gone. The radio station that had been on the year, air there for 20, 25 years, gone. I mean, there's just, it, it's gone. There's nothing left of it. And well, I'm, glad I that, I just, I'm glad that you and your wife survived it and that you're both well, still here yeah. to tell the story. Well, me too. And, you know, hopefully people will receive parts of it, if all of it. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some that are thinking, this guy is smoking that special weed or something like that. I don't know. Um, I don't know, Bill. Our audience is pretty open-minded to, to to this, and I think you had a powerful story to share, and it's it's one of education and enlightenment, and it's you know telling people how they need to be careful with who they involve in their lives. And even when you think you're oh, doing yeah. something with pure heart, that that can open up a, a world of negative intention in your life. So, Bill, I, I took quite a bit from it. Uh, I was amazed, amused, and entertained through the entire thing, as I'm sure our audience will be. Thank you for finally giving into my relentless pursuit of you, and uh, and we appreciate you joining us on the show this evening. Well, Dave, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. The Day Satan Called, A True Encounter with Demon Possession and Exorcism. Bill Scott, our guest. Bill, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh-huh.